I'm the founder and CEO of HelperAntan.com, which provides trusted connections between buyers and sellers of local services. But I'm here today because I love chocolate, and I'm going to show you how to make chocolate truffles. Chocolate truffles, people think they're hard to make, they're expensive, they're actually the easiest thing to make at home, and it's very simple ingredients, and they're delicious. So the advantage of making chocolate truffles at home are you control the ingredients. And the ingredients are simple and pure in their own way. You have chocolate. Good chocolate is essential because if you don't have a good quality chocolate, you cannot make a good truffle. Butter and cream. And then we'll add a little flavoring. So we're going to start with the cream. And you are going to microwave cream and butter together. You want them boiling hot because that's how we melt the chocolate. While the cream is warming up, we're going to start breaking up the chocolate. So you want to break up the chocolate in small pieces because they'll melt faster. The interesting thing with truffles is you need to melt the chocolate and uh, make sure you have a smooth paste but in fact we're going to then put it in the fridge and wait for it to cool again so we can roll the truffle so you want it melted but you don't want it too hot and anytime you're dealing with chocolate you really have to be careful it doesn't burn so that's two reasons to be very careful when you break up the chocolate in small pieces it melts faster so the cream is nearly boiling and the butter is nearly melted and we're going to pour that into the chocolate and then melt it by hand in the beginning what i like to do because i'm usually always in a rush when i'm doing this it's usually uh, a gift for someone and I need it as soon as possible is just melted by hand like this and then when there are extra pieces that haven't melted I take them out and melt them separately um, when I was little my mother d made a lot of cakes and every time she would make a chocolate cake my job was to melt the chocolate in the double boiler so I know the the correct way of melting chocolate is in a double boiler, but I've done it so many times, I just like to microwave it now. Um, you have to be careful, but apart from that, microwaves are a fantastic shortcut. So you can see the pieces melting bit by bit. And it's essential that you have a smooth paste when you're making truffles. And in this recipe, I've reduced a little bit the amount of cream um, to make it a bit less fatty. It's still not a low-cal food. Chocolate truffles will never be a low-cal food. Um, but I reduced the cream, and as a result, uh, I've increased the liquor part so that the paste stays manageable and soft. You can make your own trade-offs and adapt it. So now I still have a lot of chunks of chocolate. I'm going to melt those separately. I'll put them back in my Pyrex. You could put the whole bowl back into the microwave, but then if something burns, you lose everything and you have to make sure to go real gentle with the microwave so now my chocolate is nearly melted in here Okay. 
I'm going to pour it into the main mix. Now, of course, if you have a nice double boiler at home, go ahead and use that. And you can see how the chocolate is shiny, how the whole mix is shiny. Um, and there's a very nice sound, I think, to chocolate that's melted like that. Um, and it's very, sorry, we can't have smells on TV because this smells wonderful. So now we have a nice homogeneous paste. And we're going to add a bit of flavoring to it. Uh, we'll add some coffee to give it a little kick. Um, coffee goes really well with chocolate. It just, as good as chocolate is, coffee adds a little extra dimension to it. So I'll add two teaspoons of coffee and sometimes um, I'll add instead a quarter teaspoon of Turkish coffee powder. Um, Turkish coffee is fantastic because it doesn't have the bitterness um, of usual American style drip coffee and um, it has a wonderful depth of texture and taste. So, so I'm going to put some Grand Marnier in there and the point of liquor isn't just the taste, it's that it keeps the paste soft. If you don't put the liquor in there, um, then you need to add cream or butter because the chocolate paste will get really hard. And when you're trying to roll the truffles, it will just be very difficult to manage. So the, there's more to it than just uh, liking alcohol. Um, but I tried it initially with really good cognac and it was delicious. Um, I got some objections at home to pouring cognac into truffles. So um, here it's with Grand Marnier. And um, you can put other liquors too if you like them. You could also put um, mint extract or orange extract. Uh, but I like the taste of chocolate as pure as possible. So now we're going to put this mix, uh, which is ready here, and you can see the shine and um, it's really a lovely texture. We're going to put that in the fridge for half hour and you can mix it every few, every 10 minutes or so. Um, and then it will be of a consistency that you can make the truffles with. So this is the chocolate mixture as it looks after 20 minutes in the fridge. You can see that the top is hard now, so we could work with it. But the bottom inside is still quite soft. And so when I'm in a real hurry, I'll start making the truffles with the top surface. But it would be much better to wait another 10 minutes till all of it hardens a bit more. So I'm going to put it back in the fridge now. So now we're going to make the cocoa coating for the chocolate truffles. And that's something I feel very strongly about. When I see chocolate truffles that have that hard coating, to me it's just a sign of an industrial truffle. Uh, the hard coating is good for a store so that the chocolate will stay forever on their shelf, but it's not at all an indicator of a fresh truffle. So I'm going to use... This is where your own taste comes into play. I like a mix of dark cocoa that's very lightly sweetened with some sweet cocoa. Um, and you can use what you have on hand. Um, and of course, you should taste it and adjust it uh, as you go. Again, the quality of the ingredients is going to be essential. Um, so the better your cocoa that you have at home, for the dark cocoa especially, uh, the better your coating. So 
So this to me is perfect now because it's got that bitter cocoa flavor, but it's not so bitter that nobody would ever enjoy it. And you just spread it in your bowl because then you'll be rolling the truffles in it. Now we have our chocolate truffle mix and it's sort of hard enough all the way to the very bottom of the bowl. So you just take a regular spoon. I tried a melon baller and I broke it. So now I just use a regular spoon. And this is where you have to have washed your hands carefully before. Um, and I don't know another way to make chocolate truffles than with your hands. Uh, that's why it's an artisanal product. And it's that simple. If your truffle is the right, the truffle mix is the right consistency, then it will be soft enough to work with, but hard enough to keep its shape and not cover you completely with chocolate every time. And of course, as you make the truffles, you sort of realize how ubiquitous the sphere is, whether it's at the planetary level or at your little chocolate truffle level. I used to roll them in my hands, you know, in the palm of my hands, like you would roll plasticine or something, but that gets even messier. So it's easier to work just with your fingers. And you need to compress it so that there's no air inside the truffle. You just want it to be pure, dense chocolate. And I'm making them smaller so that uh, you can enjoy them with a bit less guilt. But of course, you can make them as big as you want. Uh, it goes faster if you make them bigger. And more people can enjoy them if you make them smaller. So use your fingers to smooth the truffle, to smooth out the bumps. And then you put it in the bowl. And once you have a few in the bowl, you just roll them. That's always fun. Um, and we're going to put them in a pretty bowl. Now, these are a different color cocoa because I had used a darker cocoa for that mix. And of course we need the quality control. Mm. This is the inside. And I'm just like... had candied orange peel it's delicious um, because if you like bitter things candied orange peel are both sweet and bitter at the same time and when I was living in France you would find them everywhere it was a really easy fairly common thing to get but when I came to the US 30 years ago candied orange peel were very hard to find and when you would find them they were very expensive and what disappointed me most often is that they weren't even good. So I'm just taking an orange now and peeling it, as you see, in very small slices because you're going to be slicing it afterwards. And I really like candied orange peel because you can use them as a gift, you can use them on a cake, um, and you can dip them in chocolate, which is hard to believe you can do better than a candied orange peel, but you can improve it with chocolate. When you peel your orange, you're going to end up with... Um, oranges have different thicknesses, but the white pith can be very 
thick and it's quite bitter too. So you want to thin it out. You don't want to remove everything because then you lose some of the texture. Um, but the thicker parts you remove. And the better your knife, the easier it is to do all this. What I do is that when I eat an orange at home and I know I'm going to be making candied oranges, then I just put it in a Ziploc bag where it stays relatively fresh. You can tell it's not as fresh as an, as an orange I just peeled, but it's still usable. I mean, you wouldn't keep it for too long, but you can keep it for a few days, even a week. And then when I have accumulated enough orange peel, I'll prepare my candied orange peels. And you want to cut them up. This thickness is about just right because you want to have enough orange to grab onto something but if it's too thick then it becomes bitter. The, the interesting thing about orange peel is if you eat it as is of course it's very bitter and so you need to put a fair amount of sugar to be able to enjoy it. So now I have about this, this is about a cup, a bit more than a cup, and then if you press it down, it's exactly a cup of orange peel. I'm going to put it in the pan here, and I'm going to add some sugar. So for a cup of oranges, I'm going to put a half cup of sugar. And you're better off using just plain white sugar. I've tried using um, organic brownish sugar and it tastes fabulous. It does give a more caramelly taste, but it doesn't look as good. And then we add water. So now I added a cup of water and you want the water to cover the oranges well, but you don't want too much water. What you're really doing here is a syrup. Um, and one tip I have is any of the syrup that's left when we take out the oranges, keep it and you can use it as a glaze when you make a cake or on anything else you would want an orange glaze. But it's a delicious tasting syrup, just an orange syrup that you make as a byproduct. So we want this to boil and we'll boil it for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, on, once it boils, we'll put it on a gentle boil. If you boil it too hard or too long, then the orange peels are just going to get mushy and, and they'll get destroyed. And this spoon was made by my son, Alexander, uh, when he was in elementary school. And so it's my special pastry spoon. So you can already see here that the color of the water is changing. It's becoming orange. It's not really boiling yet and nothing much else has happened. But um, you can smell the orange smell too and, um, and just see the color change. So this is what the orange peel looks like when it's ready. And if you listen carefully, you can even hear that it sounds like a syrup boiling, not like water boiling. And we're going to take them off and um, make sure that they don't disintegrate. So we need to take them out. And this is very simple. You just take them out, try to get rid of as much of the water as possible um, and lay them to dry. If you have parchment paper, it's even better than using oiled foil. And it's going to take a long time to dry, so you can keep them overnight. They're still very soggy now and they'll be just right. And if you see the syrup that remains in the pan, that syrup is now orange. It's a pretty deep orange and it's delicious poured over cakes. So I just pour it into a jar and freeze it and use it at some point later on. I actually got this recipe 
from a kids magazine, a French kids magazine. And it's a really old recipe from uh, eons ago. Um, and I started making it because I figured if it's in a kids magazine, how hard can it be? And as you can see, it's really not hard. And when you see the price of these candied orange peels in store, you're like, why would anyone buy it? So what you can do now is you can roll them in crystallized sugar. Um, and I'll do just a few of them because when you think about it, you're, you've already boiled them in syrup and now you're going to, to add even more sugar. Um, but it looks delicious. So it looks much better. It's less good for you, um, your choice. I do some rolled and some unrolled. And these you can serve as is, you can enjoy them as is, or uh, you can dip them in chocolate. And this is a set of orange peels that I made yesterday night. So you can see how they've already started to dry and I can manipulate them. They're not too sticky. And so they'll go from being shiny, this one is still shiny, so I can tell it's not ready yet, to when they're matte looking, you know, they're ready to handle and to store and put away. Um, and it's, you need time. It's, you, you can't escape the time or money equation. So with candied orange peel, you need time to let them dry. Um, I'm sure there are industrial tricks to accelerate it, but if it's just in your kitchen, you leave them somewhere overnight until they're dry and then you put them away. So I'm going to show you another recipe that I learned to make just because I love chocolate covered fruit and nuts and they're so expensive when you buy them. Um, so it's the easiest thing ever. You start with a good piece of chocolate, of good quality chocolate. And again, you break it up and you're going to melt it. You can melt it in a double boiler or you can melt it in the microwave. I'll use the microwave. And the key is to add a little bit of butter because the butter will keep the chocolate from hardening too fast. Um, if you don't put butter, then it becomes really hard, really brittle, very fast. You have to keep remelting the chocolate and then it breaks off in chunks um, off of your dried fruit. But a bit of butter will keep the chocolate malleable and, uh, and then you can do a ton of stuff with it and you'll see how easy it is. So I'm going to put it in the microwave. So this is the chocolate when it's just come out of the microwave and looks like I got it just before it started burning which is good. If you ever burn chocolate in the microwave, you cannot use that. You need to take out the burnt part, um, overshoot, take out anything that could be burnt, and then you can use the rest of it. And now when you see how easy it is to coat things with chocolate, you're like, why do I ever spend a fortune buying these? Um, so you have your melted chocolate. And we're just going to take a piece of orange peel and dip it like this. And you see how shiny the chocolate is? That's because it's still soft and usable like that. And that's it. And then you just wait for it to harden. Um, it really couldn't be easier. You just have to spend the time on it. But when you make it at home, you know that the ingredients are as sort of pure, clean, simple, there's no preservative, there's, apart from the calories, there's nothing bad for you in there. What I've started doing, I don't do it every year, but uh, when I can, is February is a really long and dark month. And, you know, in December and November, you have a ton of celebrations, but then once the new year starts, it's just dark and cold and everybody's holed up. So I'll do a chocolate bash in February and I'll cover our dining room table with everything chocolate. So chocolate covered anything I can think of um, and chocolate cookies, chocolate cakes, chocolate mousse uh, and 
I'll invite a ton of friends and they'll bring their own chocolate specialty too. And it's just fun. I've uh, also started, started adding a separate table with a few savory things because uh, you can eat more chocolate if you break it up with savory things. Um, but it's fun to just have a big chocolate celebration in the dark months. It doesn't have to be a Valentine celebration, but of course, I think that's why Valentine is in February and so associated with chocolate. And you can use your spoon to cover the piece or you can just dip it like that. And then we can do some nuts too. So I've tried it with all sorts of fruit. Figs are very sweet, so you know you can do a chocolate covered fig, but um, it's a bit much. Apricots are good. Candied ginger is good. Um, you can do nuts like this. And you can do the glazed orange peels too. These look better, but in my opinion, they just have more unnecessary calories. So I'll just stick with the regular orange peels. And of course, I use bittersweet chocolate because I like dark chocolate, but you could use milk chocolate if that's your preference. So this is what the dried fruit look like when they've stayed overnight. And as you can see, they're matte colored now. It's not shiny anymore. Um, these are nuts, prunes, I did dates, uh, walnuts, apricots, and oranges. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you make a ton of these things at home and give them to the people you love who love chocolate um, and enjoy eating these. <laughs>